Dudes from Christopher Creek Men's Retreat. Yeah! 70 dudes up there right now, and uh, Josh and I escaped early, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> uh, interesting group of guys. There's a group of men that were brought in from the Phoenix Rescue Mission so they could be blessed and encouraged this weekend. And uh, I spoke yesterday morning, and uh, it was a joy to, to share with them about bi- biblical masculinity. And, you know, you're looking at the crowd, and you're kind of sizing these guys up, and you know, there's, there's a couple moments you're looking at some dudes, you're like, that guy's scary right there. Um, but, dude, some of these the toughest guys on the exterior were crying, came up to me and just wanted to grab some one-on-one time. And the scariest was this big Mexican dude, fully tatted out, piercings, big gauges in his ears. And he came up to me, and I'm like, oh, no, what's going to happen, right? And he just gives me this big hug, and he's like, dude, you made me cry. I love you. Thank you so much. Like, awesome. So... Now I'm in uh, uh, with the Batos, and, uh, you know, we're hanging out. We're tight, my friends. So uh, so the men's retreat, keep praying for those guys. They're, they're finishing up today, and they're going to come back down. And, you know, whenever you have mountaintop experiences, when you come back down to the v- spiritual valley, sometimes that's when the enemy attacks. So pray for, for our guys. So there's a good group of Mission Day guys up there just, just growing and, and being encouraged and challenged by God. So greetings from the men's retreat. Greetings from... Slovenia as well. Zvanko and Dubruka send their greetings. They got all the money they needed for a new car. And so um, so we were able to come up with half the money, $16,000 they needed. We came up with half and said, if you get the rest of your supporters to match it, we'll, we'll get this to you. They did it. Uh, he's going to send us a picture soon of the, uh, the new ministry car. We'll call it the Gospel Chariot, right? Um, so we'll get a picture of them, but they just wanted to say, they are thankful for us. They love us. Thank you for participating in the work that's going on in Slovenia. So that's greetings from Slovenia. So uh, turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 2. Uh, we're going to start this morning. We're going to look at a couple videos real quick because I think we can learn a lot from the animal world. Now, I love, they're, they're, I love every animal in the world except for one, cats. They are of the devil. Uh, let's just put it out there. Cats are the worst creatures in the entire world. But here's the good news. Whether you love cats or hate cats, it doesn't mean you're not going to heaven or, not, or, or, or going to hell, right? If you love cats, you're not going to hell. Amen? If you don't love cats, it doesn't mean you're not going to hell either. So um, here's the deal. I love dogs, right? Man's best friend, right? So every year there's do- dog competitions, and I think we can learn a lot about ourselves from the world of dogs. So I saw two videos, and I think they, they, they provide a great picture of uh, – of our spiritual lives. Now, I want you to watch each each video. They're about two minutes long. So the first one, you'll notice this dog does the course perfectly, right? Notice this dog. Check out its little legs. I mean, just the size of the dog so cute, right? So check this out. Gabby. Andrea Samuels, a veteran handler. You talked about some of the rookies in this final. This is certainly not a rookie. And Gabby, the three-year-old, second year here at Westminster. Let's see what she can do. Nice, clean, smooth Look winning runs is what she's looking for. She's ready. Gabby just can't wait to go. But won't leave, not leaving, not leaving. Look at this dog walk. Whoa, what speed on that dog walk. Redirects a little bit, make sure they get that. Push, push, push into that tunnel. Nice job. Get to the back side of this jump. Andrea, hang in there. She thought maybe she might have got last for a quick second. Gabby has push, to be push, 43. Push. 43.20. No, that's fine. It's just time. That's time. It's just time. Wow. We're taking the long way around everything, it looks like. But this is a young, young dog. Through the weave post. Motors. Motors. Look at those weaves. And Woo! Gabby wins it on the final. All right. Wow, even with some miscommunication, some wide turns. All right, so we can stop the video there. We'll set up the next video. So now we, we, we look at this dog, and that dog, I mean, look, it breaks records. It won first place. Now, how many of us know Christians like this and sit there and go, you kind of make me sick? Like how, how well you run the spiritual course, right? Like we all see people and go, why do I not like you right now, right? Like, you seem to have everything together. You seem to be living your life perfectly. 
there, there's a small group that live their Christian lives like this. But if we're truly honest, we're all more like the next dog. I'm going to show you. So this so dog. It's wonderful to have these dogs here. This year, the Rescue Dog Agility Display Team, and it is a display rather than a competition. It consists of six different rescue groups. We've got uh, Battersea Dogs Home, Wood Green, Blue Cross, Happy Ever After, Valgrave's Border Collie Rescue, and the National Animal Welfare Trust. Now, this team consists of, <laughs> this dog's called Kratu, by the way. I do know this one. Well, I guess it's a large dog. This has come from Wood Green. Um, well, I mean, it's trying to do a course, uh, and it doesn't care very much what actually it's supposed to do. It'll just go where it wants to. This is a dog rescued in Romania for absolutely terrible conditions. Not one of the easier to breed to look after. It's a crossbreed anyway. We'll see if he's going <laughs> well, it's a question of the dog will get. It's nice in here. I like it in the tunnel. This is good. I think I'll just stay in here. No, all right. I'll come out then. The point is, we want the dogs to have fun here, and we don't care if they get it right or not. There is actually, <laughs> there is actually a, a proper route that they are supposed to take, um, and Kratu is not taking it. Is all I can say. He's just having fun. This dog flew back to Romania with Tess, who's the handler there. Uh, first Romania rescue assistance dog ever. They did some training to show what one of these rescue dogs can do. And this can do all sorts, but except it can't uh, follow instructions. This dog comes from Wood Green. All right. Who can identify with the second dog? Let's be honest, right? I love what the commentator says, right? Like, we're more uh, wanting the dog to have fun than to have a perfect performance, right? Can I tell you, that's like the heart of God towards his people. I think there's a God who says to us, I want you to enjoy this. I want you to enjoy me. I don't want you to worry about following the instructions so that you can have a perfect performance but i want you to have fun and enjoy what i have done for you amen we need to be reminded of this and from the world of dogs we're more like car two, the romanian rescue dog than gabby whatever the little dog type was but your performance is a bad measurement of your spiritual life amen we should not be focused on our performance also, another bad way to measure your spirituality is to measure yourself against other people's spirituality. Amen? See, while we should be wary of performance evaluation of ourselves, we should always evaluate our progress, how, we, how we're doing. And this morning we get to tackle this topic from the, from the very heart of the Apostle Paul, from the very words of, of God's word to us, Colossians. We need to acknowledge God's work of grace. That it's a good thing. That we should not beat ourselves up too much. That God does not want us to be self-condemning, self-critical, but ever evaluating our progress. What does that balance look like in our lives? Colossians 2 gives us a picture of that. Turn there. We're going to look at verses 4 through 7 this morning. I want to look at three major points that Paul talks about. Because having stability ultimately has nothing to do with you. Having stability ultimately has nothing to do with our circumstances. Having stability has nothing to do with the course that God has set for us to, to walk in. Stability is rooted in Christ. Stability is rooted in God. Stability is not rooted in what you do. It's stability is found in what God is doing. Amen? Today we want to connect with His heart. Today we want to listen to His Spirit. Today we want to focus on the marvelous riches we have in Christ. And so three things we're going to look at today. A stable believer is a disciplined believer, number one. Turn to Colossians chapter 2. Look at verse 4 where he says this. I say this. What did he just say? Well, last Sunday, Easter, Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, we unpacked the treasures that are ours in Christ. 
Amen? We, there are riches for us in Christ that will continue to astound us and amaze us. He says, in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And I say this, verse 4, in order that no one may delude you with persuasive arguments. For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless, I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. Key word right there, stability. As you, therefore, have received Christ the Lord, so walk in him. Having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. You can go ahead and ver- uh, circle verses 6 and 7. That's the heart of Colossians right there. This is the theme of the entire letter to this church some 2,000 years ago. 6 and 7, those verses really provide an incredible framework to unpack this topic of stability in our lives. So first and foremost, a stable believer is a disciplined believer. Look at verses 4, 5, 6. Two things I want you to know here that the apostle focuses us on so that we would also have stable lives today. The first is this. Discipline is God-focused wisdom. Wisdom is a God-focused wisdom because there is no wisdom in anyone else. And what God is, his character, and what God does, his actions, what God has given, his word, that is where true wisdom is found. And it is so important to our spiritual maturity. How many of us have ever tried to find wisdom apart from God? Just raise your hand. And, and how has that worked out for us? Not, not so good, right? People are seeking wisdom. There's this love of of philosophy. We are all philosophers in the sense that we all love wisdom. The problem is many of us seek wisdom from the wrong places. And God says, look at what that's done to your lives because the world will offer a wisdom that seems wise. Boy, it sounds good. It looks pretty. It shines. But in the end, the world's wisdom doesn't lead us to God. It often leads us away from God. This is why Paul says his heart for the church is that I want to prevent you from falling in love with persuasive arguments. See, it is amazing what the human imagination will come up with. It is amazing what human innovation can create. And it is designed to not lead you to God. It is designed to lead you apart from God. And that you have to be careful, ladies and gentlemen. I don't even want you to listen to my wisdom. I want you to listen to God's wisdom. Follow me as I follow Christ. Listen to me as I am obedient and adhering to the scriptures. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to lead you to a cistern that has no good water for your soul. Ladies and gentlemen, discipline of seeking God-focused wisdom is so important, and these are reflected in the daily habits of life. What goes in is ultimately going to come out in your actions and your, your behavior. What have you been filling your minds with? What have you been filling your hearts with? Because we are not to be given to these flights of fancy or these flashy, fleshly preachers. This week, I was, I was, I was exposed to... The new fad among preachers is called Preachers in Sneakers. And it is about all these high-level, highfalutin preachers that are wearing $2,000, $3,000, $4,000 sneakers. I've got my $16 Ross grandpa sandals on, and I'm a happy camper. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm, I, 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 it breaks my heart because these are people that some of you listen to and some of you... And really, is this going to be the news, not the message they preach, but the sneakers they wear? What have we become? Have we become a church culture of fashion and fad? And I talk to Christians all the time, and they're like, I'm going to this church, and you should see what they've done with the sound system. And I sit there and go, is that what we're to elevate and prop up? If 
Like, I rarely hear believers say, boy, with my church community this Sunday, Sunday, we were in the word, and here's the truth that came out, and here's the wisdom from God that I, and I rarely hear that. What I hear is, oh, the band made me feel so good. The pastor was wearing such sick clothes. Yeah, he was. My 3D glasses shirt, right? Here's the thing. We must, even in light of current cultural evangelical trends, must fight against even that current in order to be the men and women God wants us to be. I'm going to tell you right now, it's not popular. You're not going to be written up in some sort of Christian magazine. John Chris won't show a little funny video about you. You need to be men and women of wisdom, and that wisdom solely comes from the Word of God. Amen? There is wisdom in nothing and no one else. This is Paul's heart. Because we are preaching a simple reliance upon Christ. Don't complicate it. Don't complicate it with more and more church bells and whistles. Don't complicate it with more and more programs and Bible studies. The simple message of the word is simple reliance on the word. Clever and impressive speech that gives the appearance of being sophisticated and substantive. I'm at the men's retreat yesterday morning, and we're in the Word. And, and I told the guys, I said, if you're not part of a church that's taking you to the Word of God, that is not a church that you want to be a part of. You know, there's churches that will say, you know, hey, we're going to go through the five love languages. Really? which are really not rooted in the word of God, they may be good and make your relationships a little less frictiony. But I'll tell you what, if you're not part of a church that doesn't take you to the word, you need to find a church that takes you to the word. Amen? And a few guys said, where's your church? And I said, that's not why I'm here. I'm not here to recruit you, but I'm here to throw down the most important part of our lives and that is a gospel-saturated, gospel-communicative, gospel-grounded church. Amen? That's why I even Kerry yesterday, Kerry Hogan quoted me. He says, the moment I don't take you to the word or the moment I don't point you to Jesus, you can shoot me. And that still stands today, just so you know. That's why we get to the word quickly, because I don't want you guys brandishing your firearms, right? <laughs> All right, pastor, you told us this is okay, right? And why is wisdom from God so important? Because it's going to help you detect that which is fake, that which is counterfeit, that which is defective, that which is ultimately not good for your soul. I'm a small business owner, and I've come across counterfeit bills, came across one a couple weeks ago. One of my staff took it. I'm not going to name names. But it was a $50 bill, and I can tell you right now, the moment I took that $50 bill into my hand, I knew it was fake right away. And you want to know why I knew it was fake right away? Because I handled what was true for so long, the fake was obvious. Amen? When you handle the truth of God's wisdom regularly and become familiar with it, the moment something fake or defective or counterfeit pops in your world, you know it's not right. See, wisdom allows us to be discerning. Discernment then ought to begin to direct our steps toward God or away from God. And the more discerning you are in the path that leads to God, the more stability takes place in your life. That's good. We need that because so many of us want stability, but we don't want to discipline ourselves in seeking the wisdom, the heart of our Father. There's no wisdom apart from Him. But you need to be careful, though. You need to be careful about this because it's going to affect your walk, which is the second point. There's discipline in God honoring walking. Notice verse 6 which is really the heart of Paul, not just in, in Colossians, but throughout all of his writings, is, is the walk, the daily living with, with Christ. And we need to be careful how we walk with God because the tendency is to have this contractually based relationship with God. Like, God, 
You and I are now in a contract with one another. And so I'm going to start asking you for things. And, and I'm going to, I'm, the expectation is that you're going to give me what I need. And the more I walk with you, the more you're going to give me what I need. And it becomes the seedbed for legalism. See, I was reminded of this uh, great movie came out years ago, Saving Private Ryan. Powerful, powerful film. And the scene that, that is so, so dangerous is the scene. So you know the premise of the movie. This woman has lost all her boys in World War II. It takes a place around the events of Normandy. She's lost all her sons in battle except for one. And, and the government says, we need to send a group in there to rescue her son so she doesn't lose all her boys. And you remember Captain Miller goes in. And he's on the bridge talking to the last surviving son. And he has suffered a mortal wound. And his last words to this, this boy who's going to be sent back home is this. Earn this. Earn this. Fast track to the end of the film when that boy is an old man and he's sitting by the grave of, of Captain Miller. And he says, I'm here, and my family's here, and friends are here. And he's saying like this silent prayer to the, to the tomb, right? And he's saying, I've lived my life trying to pay back the debt you did to save me. And I hope I've lived it good enough. And there's a sense of inadequacy. There's a sense of falling short. There's a sense of, did I do enough? And tragically, we as Christians have fallen into that same mentality. Right? As if we can pay back the debt of God's rescue mission to save us. Can I tell you right now? You can never pay back the debt that God has extended to you. Amen? And nor is he asking you to. Because he knows it's impossible. And so this whole earn this mentality needs to be done away with. You don't earn it. You accept it. And once you accept it, you just walk in it. You understand the riches and the magnificence and the beauty of having been saved from war and combat and the very things that are aimed to destroy you. And now you have been redeemed. You've been rescued. The greatest rescue mission of all. And now God says, don't enter into some legalistic contractual relationship with me where you think you can earn it. That you're weighed down with this burden that you've never done enough. Just so you know, you're my child and because you're in my family, that's enough. That's enough. Who needs to hear that this morning? Just raise your hand. Who needs to hear that? Don't come to God on business terms. The business transaction has been done at the cross. Come to him in familial terms. Come to him as he is a loving papa and you're his glorious son. You're his wonderful daughter. Don't turn this into a business deal. Live in it as you are part of the family of God. That's how we walk. And we walk in submission to this King, this Lord, this God who has shown us such good love. Such amazing grace. Such loving mercy. Discipline yourself. And, and you're growing in wisdom and you understand these things. The moment you disregard God's wisdom is the moment you're leaning on human imagination and all human imagination come up with is legalistic lifestyle. That's a tweet-worthy moment right there. Did you hear what I just said? If you lean upon human imagination, human imagination knows nothing of divine grace. It only knows of continuing to create a, a seedbed of legalism, which ultimately leads to dead living. No wonder we are instability. We have this instability in our life. We've missed out of really learning the wisdom of God and who we are and who he is and what that relationship looks like. Who thanks God that you're a part of his family through Jesus Christ? Amen. Who thanks God that you can never earn your salvation? <laughs> that is a burden that we were never designed to carry. Thank God he did it for us.
once you understand this discipline, the importance of disciplines in our lives, right? Making it a daily habitual practice of growing in wisdom and just walking with Christ, it leads us to our next point, and that is this. A stable believer is a growing believer. And I love the terms that Paul uses here as he moves from verse 6 into verse 7, which is really the the outward practicing of what we've already learned in verse 6. Verse 7 says this, there's two things that have to do with your growth. Two words that Paul uses, one is rooted, second is you are being built up. So let's talk about these because the, this, the first word is a word from the world of agriculture. Rooted, right? The idea that Psalm 1 that Mike read, let's, let's throw it up on the screen, Psalm 1. Check out these words. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, right? That's human wisdom. Nor stands in the se- way of sinners, that's human wisdom. Nor sits in the seat of scoff- scoffers, that's human wisdom. But his delight, the thing that makes his heart beat, the, make, the thing that gives him butterflies in his stomach, right? Gives, makes him giddy like a schoolgirl, right? His delight is in the wisdom of God. And on this wisdom, this law, he meditates how often? 24-7. 24-7 because we know what we're like without it. He is like a tree planted. He is like a tree rooted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its seasons and its leaf does not wither and all that he does, he prospers. The biblical picture is very organic. It comes from the world of agriculture where your roots go down deep and there is nourishment in that world that sometimes cannot be seen by the human eye. That we as believers in Christ are rooted in him. And when you're rooted in him, your roots are secured by him. Your tree is nourished by him. And unlike a tumbleweed, who's ever come across a tumbleweed? Like when you're driving northern Arizona, I remember taking college kids to Purgatory, now called Durango Mountain, and we're driving along the Navajo Reservation, and there's tumbleweeds just coming like crazy. Why? Because the tumbleweed has no root. And that tumbleweed, when the winds blow, it will go wherever the winds blow. It seems so light. And my favorite thing was to drive a car about 85 miles per hour and just see those things shatter. Right? But in Christ, no matter what wind comes our way, you are rooted and you are not able to be moved. There's nothing that's going to come along and destroy that which is rooted in Christ. See, Paul is telling you something about your identity. Part of what it means to to walk with Christ is to to suck the nourishment that he offers to you. Is he not the bread who satisfies like none other? Is he not the water that satisfies your thirst like none other? He is everything we need. So your life, my life, is rooted in Christ. My hope is rooted in his goodness That is my identity. That is my security. And this brings stability to the believer's life. And not only are we rooted, which is the foundational element, because there's no stability apart from Christ. Can we all agree with that right now? There's a reason why Jesus makes bold statements like, I am the resurrection and the life. He makes bold statements like, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is why he makes statements, he says, I'm the door Right? I'm the way to heaven. No one gets to the Father but by me. These are exclusive claims that can be only uttered by God himself. And he does it to us through his son. He gives it to us through his son. That is foundational. What we are talking about today, ladies and gentlemen, because there's someone that may be here today that understands stability begins with a relationship with Christ and understanding what he's done for us on the cross. Second point is this. You're being built up which now is the functional element of our lives in Christ. This is the day-to-day practice of what it means to be rooted in Him. This is now from the world of architecture. Isn't it cool how Paul borrows from these different realms that these people are very familiar with? This is an agricultural culture. They understand the importance of, of trees and bushes and fruits and shrubs and things like that. But they're also amazing builders. And he says, you are being built up in him, which is 
God's ongoing work in us even today. How many of you have had major renovation going on by God, maybe just today already? You know what I'm saying? You hear the, you hear the, the drills, the, maybe there's some jack. How many had, had a jackhammer set to your, your life today? How many this week was just like, man, the renovation this week was hardcore. God is in the business of construction, but sometimes with construction, there needs to be deconstruction. Amen? Sometimes with God's building project, there needs to be this, this restoration, this renovation. I'm a sucker for all those home you know, improvement shows, right? But all I know is that when they want to get something looking good, sometimes they have to do a lot of tearing down. How many of you felt the tearing down of God in your life recently? He's removing the stuff that doesn't matter. Because he's building a house that is more glorious than you would ever imagine. See, this is the language he uses for this, this little church in, in, in Asia Minor. He's saying to this church, you're not only rooted, but you need to know that God's up to something even today. He's building you up in Christ. And how many times does Jesus even allude to the construction language? Right? You have your choice to build your home on, on shifting sand or a solid foundation. He himself declares that I'm the cornerstone and the capstone. You know what that means? He's the beginning and the end. You need the cornerstone, why? Because, because the cornerstone sets the trajectory to make sure the walls are not crooked, that the roof fits and it doesn't fall off. So the cornerstone's important to get your life started, but the capstone is the final project that makes it all beautiful in the end. Jesus is the beginning and the end. He's the Alpha and the Omega. How many times did Jesus say that when he takes over a new dwelling, he drives out the old man and the new man now takes over as the landlord? Because he says a house divided against itself cannot stand. Who uttered those words in American history? He's borrowing off Jesus, that guy. But what is he saying? It's something important. Jesus, not necessarily Abraham Lincoln. Jesus says, you need to understand you're only inhabited by one new glorious landlord, and his name is Jesus, and he's going to take care of the property. Because the guy that used to live there, he treats it like crap, and you don't want him around. I think we've all experienced bad landlords in our life. Amen? Amen. We've all wrestled with bad property owners, haven't we? But I'm going to tell you right now, when it comes to being built up in Christ, you have the best manager, best owner, best landlord possible, and he's making us into this new glorious creation. And he's going to perfect that work until the day of Christ Jesus. So when does the construction end? That's the question. Never in this life. Aww! We will constantly be built up in Christ till the day we die and we meet him face to face and we're going to realize one day whether we realize it now or not one day we'll realize all the chiseling all the jackhammering all the removal of all the dirty filthy materials was worth it so that we could see christ ever more clearly can i get an amen on that one see we need to be reminded of this that god is doing something for us and no matter how Many times come and our spiritual and moral failures look massive and seem to dwarf our achievements and wonder what God's doing. We're assured of this. Nothing will lead God to forsake his work in us. Is that good? Do we need to hear that? Because again, we're looking and we don't understand. We're looking and we're confused. We're looking and we're frustrated. And that's not where to focus on. We do not look at ourselves. We look at the one who promises that he is going to build his work and nothing will stand against it. We're being carved by this master builder. And I'm going to tell you right now that the, the, the spirit of God has this amazing way of saying to us, the renovation, the deconstruction is worth it. For the glory and honor of God. Third point. See, not only is a stable believer a disciplined believer, not only is the believer, stable believer, a a growing believer, lastly, the stable believer is a worshiping believer. And I want you to notice how specifically worship is to look like in our lives. Because the word worship, I think, has fallen on hard times. And especially in our current evangelical landscape, when we hear the word worship, so many times we're automatically generated to think of music. That's one small part of worship. The Bible defines worship as so much more than that. I'm going to tell you right now that worship 
is, is, is anything that compels your heart, your mind, your spirit to give back to God because He is worthy. Right? Worship can be music, but worship can be spending money. Worship can be driving your car. Worship can be dancing. Not in my case, but in some people's worlds, you know. Worship can be how you ride a bike. Worship can be any how you bake in the kitchen. Worship is a, is a disposition of the heart that says, God is awesome. And he's deserving of any bit of adoration I can muster up. Because in the end, it is about him, not me. So what does worship look like as you grow in Christ? Two things. Worship first results from assurance. Think about this. Look what he says in verse 7. He says, as uh, you're being firmly rooted and now you're being built up in him and established in your faith. Stop right there. Established in your faith. Strengthened in your faith. Understand that word is a legal word. It is a legal word which tells us that there is now a formal legal document that God has transacted between himself and you. And here's what that legal document declares. And you want to write this down. God has bounded himself to me. This is rich. Because legally what God has said is, is that I am now bound to you. And once he binds himself to someone or something, his faithful character proves he will never go back on what he promises. He has established us, strengthened us, but again, the work is entirely his. As is everything we've already covered this morning, in each of these verses, this is God orchestrating all these things. See, you and I are the recipients of a God who has made a covenant promise to us. And the moment he denies his very character is the moment you can be start feeling less assured. But because God is perfect and he can never go back on his own character and and go back on his own word, he has bounded himself to you. And because of that relationship, you ought to be the most assured people in the world. Amen? The cross is the demonstration of God saying, I bind myself to you. And what that means is I have committed myself to you. There is now a formal pledge of myself to you to help you grow, to help you walk. And I have sealed this relationship through the death and burial and resurrection of my son. And no one or nothing could ever come and separate that relationship between me and you. That's assurance. We need that, don't we? Because there's so many times our feelings betray us. Our emotions betray us. Because we're more like Cartoon the dog and then Gabby the dog. Right? We're hiding in the little tunnel. Right? And even when the master says, come on, we're like, oh, you know, we're just going to do our own thing. And, and so many times we look at our performance and we begin to doubt our assurance. And God says to us, I will never, ever look at your life on how well you perform. But what I'm looking for is a heart that just wants to love me. See, it's not about performance. It's about passion. It's about those those things that we have a hard time putting our finger on, but it's the very thing that makes us human and unlike any other creature in the world. Because you and I are different than the dogs and the cats and the birds and We are the only creation created in God's image. Which means now there exists a unique relationship and we could never build the bridge to him, right? We can't earn it, but he has made this binding commitment to us. And he says, as sure as I'm true to my own character, you need to know I'm going to love you forever in Christ. We We need to hear that, don't we? We live in a world where we tend to really grade, evaluate, rate people. Right now in China, there is a system being established and it's already being rolled out where now every Chinese citizen will be on a rating system. 
if you guys, you guys did not know this yet, this is Black Mirror, Twilight Zone stuff coming to reality. This is the dystopian future we have set up for ourselves. And just so you know, I, I've got it on my phone, I'm going to read you the article from Business Insider just from two weeks ago. Here's what the Chinese government is already doing. That they will watch your behavior. They will watch how you lead your animals. If your dog is not on a leash, guess what? You're automatically given a negative score. To this date, there have been men and women who have smoked in, in smoke-free areas, and they've been caught, and they've been given a grade. And there are 9 million-plus men and women in China who cannot get on an airplane because they have been graded so poorly. There are 3 million people who can't even get on a train and travel within their country because they've been graded so poorly. This is true stuff. And ladies and gentlemen, you need to understand something. So often we get this mentality and, and we are, we're so quick to evaluate people because it's always good to find someone worse off than you because it makes you look better, amen? But in China, they are living in a world where now it is all performance-based and becoming much more so. China has started ranking citizens with a creepy social credit system. Here's what you can do wrong and the embarrassing, demeaning ways they can punish you. Number one, it says they can ban you from flying or getting on a train. Number two, they can throttle your internet speeds. Number three, they can ban you and your kids from the best schools. Number four, they can stop you from getting the best jobs. Number five, they can keep you out of the best hotels. We never stay at the best hotels, so it doesn't really affect us anyways. Um, number six, getting your dog taken away. Number seven, being publicly named as a bad citizen. And it goes on. More and more, the world is leading that way because it's all about how we conduct ourselves in a social, civic context that you will be rated and graded and perhaps lose out on things that you really desperately want and how this creeps over into our world of religion, how this creeps over into our spirituality. And here's what I'm trying to prevent, you guys. Don't let this mentality creep into your walk with God. Do not let bad theology, and bad theology is anything that we can come up with, <laughs> don't let bad theology creep into the best theology of, 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 of what we understand from the Bible. That God loves us as we are where we are. That his love is unconditional. That his love is never based upon our performance. That he wants what's best for us. And even when we can't see it ourselves, even when we can't understand for ourselves, God's way, God's word, God's will is always the best. But we are never to self-condemn or self-criticize ourselves when we do mess up. And we know that there's a loving Father eagerly awaiting to restore us, to pick us up and say, all right, let's do this again. But there's nothing you could ever do performance-wise to perform your way out of God's grace. Because He who is for us is greater than anyone or anything could ever be against us. And that means ourselves, because are we not our own worst enemies? When you have this sense of assuring love from the Father, your life is free to worship Him in such amazing, crazy, reckless ways. When you are assured of the Father's love for you, you are freed up from the opinions and the perceptions and the thoughts and the criticisms of other people. Now, I'm not saying you don't allow people to speak into your lives, right? We need that for one another because you know who's for you and you know who's, who wants the best for you. But what I'm saying is this, you're not compelled to live each and every day to impress your friends. You are compelled to live for your father and to walk with his son because of the grace he's shown you through, the, through Jesus. Which then leads us to the last point. Now check this out. Perhaps one of the greatest ways you can worship God is this. Worship resulting in gratitude. The Bible puts a premium on how, how thankful your life is. I know. I totally agree. How thankful your... 
Too many of us, can I, can I just call, you, call us all on the carpet right now? Too many of us in this room have allowed this root of bitterness to starve out the gratitude we ought to be experiencing. It goes back to the contractual relationship we, we have with God. Because we're ticked because God hasn't given us what we wanted. We're ticked because God knows our prayers. He hears our prayers, and he hasn't given us what we've asked for. And it's contract, right? Well, God, you've done this. I've done this, so you should do this. And here's what God wants you to know. We talked about this at Passover, at the Passover Seder. The Jews every year sing a song at their Passover meal called Deanu. Deanu. It would have been enough. That's what the Hebrew is. And what that says is, it would have been enough for God to rescue us and to do nothing else for us. Whoa. We're getting into hardcore Christianity right now. It would have been enough for God to save us and to give us nothing else. Does that reflect your heart? Because I'm going to tell you right now, that's hard. I, I, I get frustrated. I get frustrated, I get angry, I get perturbed because it never seems like God's working on my timetable. How about you? You ever, you ever get there? Like, God, what are, you, what are you doing? You know, this, 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 this bitterness of like, I should have this. I, I, I ought to have this. God, you know I need this to make me happy. And I'm going to tell you right now, if God doesn't give it, and you seek it from someplace else, it's not going to create grateful hearts. It's going to create embittered hearts. And bitterness starves out the Spirit's work of creating a thankful person that He wants you to be. Ingratitude always points to spiritual deficiency. An ungrateful heart always points to spiritual impoverishment. A thankless person is evidence of a spiritually shallow person. I could say it probably a hundred other ways. You want me to go on? Do you get it? Yeah, you're like, it's, it's painful enough, Pastor. Because how many of us are truly thankful before our God. Now, before you answer that, let me explain what that looks like. Because this is why we come together on Sunday mornings. This is a Thanksgiving service. I was part of a Baptist church. I think they did the Thanksgiving service the night before Thanksgiving. I'm going to tell you right now, God deserves more thankfulness than one, one night a, a year. Amen? This is a Thanksgiving time. This is a time when we as God's people come together and we sing those songs and go, yeah, that's my heart right there. What you guys have shown on the screen reflects where I'm at with God. And when we dive to the word, as, as tough as it is to wrestle with the word, we, tr we get to the spirit and, and the truth and we go, yeah, I've been pretty selfish this week. I've been pretty mad at God. I've been, I've been living my life wayward. But this is the beauty of the worship gathering is that it is meant to bring us together because would it have been enough had God saved us and given us nothing else? Amen? Would it have been enough for us to say, yes, God is good solely because he gave us Jesus? And guess what? I didn't get anything else from God this week, but it would have been enough had he only given me Christ. And I'm here to declare that praise today. Stop being petulant children with an entitlement attitude. Think that God owes you anything else. Because with Christ crucified, it would have been enough. Right? Move out of the bitterness of your hearts. Because a thankless spirit betrays a life that is no longer focusing on the greatness of Christ. And no wonder we live in a thankless Christian culture. Because where is the greatness of Christ? It is buried and buried and buried and buried. And instead, we've got the greatness of preachers and sneakers. <laughs> no! No! Thanksgiving is essential to the Christian life because it is an expression. It is an expression, whether it be thought, word, or deed, of our satisfaction in who God is and what he's done for us in Jesus. 
Are you satisfied in him because he has ransomed your hell-bound soul and now destined you for eternal life with him? Are you satisfied with that? Because if, what else do you want? Because the moment you say, I want Jesus plus this, is the moment your greatness of Christ is diminished. And you're being sold a lie, and anyone that tells you you need something more, doggone it, that is from the pit. The pit of hell. Oh, did I just say hell? It's like the guy who changed the marquee at the, at the movie theater somewhere in the Midwest. Hellboy, movie out right now, he calls it Heck Boy. Because he didn't want to offend people. As if heck's any better. You know what heck is? Heck is eternal darnation from gosh. And you don't want to go there. <laughs> I've been with you guys a long time. You've never heard that one before, have you? Some of you are like, oh, good joke. New joke from Pastor Scott, right? Doesn't matter how you spin it. Yeah, right. You can do it. Heck is eternal darnation from gosh. Right, there you go. All right. Look at these verses on thankfulness. Philippians chapter 4. Because this is, what, this is what we're going out on. Don't be anxious about anything. What are you allowed to be anxious about? <laughs> you guys are master theologians. I love it. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with. See, thanksgiving. That's the thing that reminds us that the greatness of Christ is ultimately what we need to keep in focus. Because sometimes our prayer and supplications get out of hand. Thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Come to him with a thankful heart. Check out this next verse, Ephesians chapter 5. Paul writes, let there be no filthiness or foolish talk nor crude joking which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. This is talking about the community of God. When do you get together with other people and just declare your thanksgiving to God in a community setting? How about this next verse we got on the, the screen here? This is from uh, Thessalonians 5. Give thanks in all circumstances. What circumstances are you allowed not to thank God for? Think about this. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ for you. Because what does thankfulness do? It creates a heart that says, I don't want to lose sight of the greatness of Jesus. You want more? Glad you asked. Here's some more. Ephesians 5, giving thanks always. How often are you to give thanks? Always. And for everything. To God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Is that enough? No, it's not enough. We need more. Here we go. F Hebrews 13. Though, uh, through him, let us then continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. A thankful mouth reveals a grateful heart. Don't honor God merely with your lips. Let your heart burn with fire because the greatness of Jesus has been shown to you. Is that enough? You want more? Okay, you asked. Here we go. Colossians 3. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, which indeed you were called in one body. Be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. This is the gathering. This is the church. Right? We're letting the peace of God rule in our hearts. We're letting the word of Christ dwell richly in us. And we're singing together. And what's going to happen as a result of this? We're going to be a thankful people. Let me close with this story and put it all in perspective for us. So there's this pastor who was robbed one night. And afterwards, he told his friends that there were four things after being robbed he was grateful for. Now, just stop right there. This person is obviously an alien, not from this world, right? Like, who gives thanks after being robbed? Well, this pastor said... This is the only thing that he was led to do because he didn't want his soul to become embittered. Four things he was grateful for. Number one, he was grateful that he had never been robbed before. After many years of life in this world, this is the first time he had been robbed. For, so that he was grateful. Number two, he said, though they took all my money, I'm glad they did not get very much. Third, he said, though they took my money, they did not take my life, and I'm thankful for that. Number four, 
he suggested, I am also thankful that it was I who was robbed and not I who robbed. How many of us could turn any situation into a platform for thanksgiving? Here's your homework this week. Whatever happens to you, don't go to the fleshly, sinful nature route of always looking at the negative. Consider how God wants to be shown great even in those negative experiences we go through. Stop and consider how does God want me to turn this moment, this situation, this circumstance, this relationship into something that creates a heart that is thankful and not creating a heart that is embittered? How many of you think that's a good lesson for this week? Complaining and grumbling and bitterness has no room in the kingdom of God. But men and women with thankful hearts, oh, may their tribe increase. Amen? Keep a list. Journal. Write it down. How does God want you to be thankful every day and in all circumstances? You're only going to be able to do this as you keep your eyes focused on the greatness of Christ. Because with him, it would have been enough had he sav saved us and given us nothing else. But he's given us so much more. Amen. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word which we want to dwell richly in us. Thank you for the spirit that you have given to confirm the truths that we've unpacked today. And thank you for the perspective of your gift of grace in Christ to us. We are a people who oftentimes want what you give us rather than just want you. We have thought that the pursuit of the gifts is more important than the one who has given those gifts. And we're just saying, we're sorry, forgive us, and show us today and this week how to live lives, just focusing on the greatness of Jesus. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the time in song. Thank you for the time in the word. Thank you for the time of just dialogue and, and even just the time to just interact with each other. Thank you for creating a community of men and women who love you and love each other, continue to perform that great work among us. And we want this for you. We want to glorify you in, in just, a, it's just a way to reflect to you our appreciation, our thankfulness for a God who's loved us like he has. Thank you for what we have in Christ Jesus. May we live to honor you and glorify you in all things. And we pray this in his name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face to you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Have a great day, you guys. See you soon. Out of my brain, I was trying to pretend I was fine when inside it was warm. Hey, thanks for watching the video. We uh, hope you've been blessed and encouraged by, uh, by watching it. Stay tuned for future videos. Uh, if you're ever in the Phoenix area, we'd love for you to join us in person at Sozo Coffee. We're at Warner and Alma School. Two services every Sunday, 9 and 1045. Check out the churchisaverb.org for more information. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.